Everybody breathe in. Hold it. And let it go. Okay, one more time. We're going to breathe in all of the culture in this room. The Calder above us, the Motherwell behind us, the Rauschenberg over here to my right. Okay, we're going to breathe all that in. And blow out all those negative ions. It's so great to see so many familiar faces here in the construct of the Portland Art Museum. I am pleased to be here. I want to start by saying, um, yes, I am some of those things that Tina mentioned. Um, however, I am not an art historian, nor am I a Duchamp or a Lewitt scholar. And actually, I forget a, quite a lot when it comes to Duchamp. He's probably the artist that I'm uh, most indebted to, um, and yet that I know the least about. And I think I like it that way. We're going to start with uh, discussing this piece. Um, and even though I studied French, I can't pronounce the B-O-I-T-E. Does anyone know? Boite en valise, otherwise known as box in a suitcase. There are supposedly up to um, over 300 of these that exist out in different permutations. This uh, object that you see here is the very final um, edition, and anyone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure on that one. And this existed in a number of 70. So there were only 70 of these. And um, what he, Duchamp built this piece explicitly so that um, aside from being sort of a greatest hits package, he called it an album, which I think is fascinating because when I think of albums, I think of records by Aerosmith, you know, and those things that you opened up and had flaps. And, um, and this is sort of the greatest hits. Basically, you, to, to be a portable museum incorporating all of his work that he could put under his arm and just go any way we're with. Wouldn't it be amazing if any of the artists in this room could do something like this and have uh, a portfolio that was as explicit and simple? And there are various uh, museum presentations. This is one of many. Um, you, if you go online and look up the piece, you can see probably five different variations. And one thing I want to say that's so exciting about this piece, when I f this is the first time I saw it, was walking into the Portland Art Museum and taking this corner, and it was probably the last thing I ever expected, and I was like, what is the, uh, and it kind of just took my wind away. But the most exciting thing about this piece for me is what you don't see, is, is that it's a big tease, and, and there are reportedly 68 to 81 objects within this collection. You can only see about 11. And I really appreciate a piece like this because he goes from <clears throat> being someone who creates ready-mades that you know, go from one stage, which are basically two objects, or maybe even just a single object, um, you know, that's something that's common found in your household, into, uh, into miniatures of those same objects. So therefore, it's almost like a, when I look at this piece, I, I think it's like a Xerox of a Xerox of a Xerox. The other reason <coughs> that I very much appreciate Duchamp <coughs> is that he's probably the only artist, again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm often wrong, who actually retired to play chess. So he played, he played games. In a way, this is like you know a box that you'd find checkers in. It's kind of like a final resting place. There's something very romantic about this piece to me. By the way, this piece um, is attributed to um, from or by Marcel Duchamp or a Rose C'est la Vie. Does anybody know who Rose C'est la Vie is? I'm sure half of you do. 
Um, and I plan to do this talk in drag. <laughs> well, it's, I just couldn't coordinate. That's, that's my problem. I'm going to ask people to make sure you take a look at the valise as we move. And we're going to be moving physically down this hallway and around behind where that glass is. How, how great is it to be, you know, in one space, you know, with a Judd right there, uh, with this perplexing Lewitt in the center, where it belongs, across from this amazing work. This is Solowitz's Incomplete Cube, or it's uh, the Incomplete Cube number 8 to 12, although it only looks like one piece to me. Maybe he's talking about angles. Um, I love this piece, uh, and I love the series that it comes from. I love what Lewitt had to say about this work. When I first came upon this work, and it was here, <laughs> um, I immediately thought about Houdini. I thought about cutting a lady in half. I thought, this is the scale. I was like, this is such a weird sized piece um, because it feels contained, even though it's, 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 it's almost my size, so I have to contend with it body-wise. Um, and they were in various gestations through drawing and um, sculpture. Several of these are seen outdoors. It's great that it's right here. It would, this, if, if anyone's come to my studio, I knew you have, uh, this looks like my studio. <laughs> it, it's amazing. Uh, I feel this kinship with this artist. Uh, the first time I saw his work uh, was at the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I was so excited, it was the first museum I ever went into that was free. I've seen them presented in museums, uh, sort of in series, and it looks like a room of chaos. However, if you look at the initial drawings that he made, you'll notice that they're just very, very clean lines, and almost they almost look like um, letters from the alphabet. You know, there's Ys and these different angles. I don't, I, um, I don't actually, I'm still kind of figuring out why I make anything, why I make objects. So it's very encouraging when, um, when I look at drawings of the period. He, he basically, you know, was creating a cube by uncreating it, you know, by, by taking its parts uh, and erasing, you know, certain lines um, and certain um, angles, and then, but still making it stand as a cube would. One of his most Im important pieces was the way that you look at the piece in light, in space, in time. So I'm looking at the piece from this angle and I see three lines and then I stand up and I see four, and, you know, four, four, four legs, what have you. But I think he envisioned these pieces to be seen outdoors, honestly, because the shadow was a very important part of the, the gaze in looking at this piece. And I don't think that that's gonna change all that much in this space. Um, there might be some natural light from over there, but um, that's, that's not to say that this isn't in a, a penultimate way of presenting this work. Um, because oftentimes, you know, one of the things that museums have to uh, contemplate is conservation and light and um, condensation and all those things that happen within, you know, enclosed spaces. But I, I personally would like to just maybe, maybe like, how Warhol shot Empire. I'd like to see this outside and, and shot for 24 hours, you know, in, in Portland, you know, as in one of these crazy days when the clouds are, are moving really quickly. One thing 
that uh, I was thinking of as I was walking over here from downtown was that uh, what a beautiful day it was today. The sun came out and it kept playing in my head like the, the words about the sun and sol, of course, is the prefix to sole. And uh, he definitely, uh, without being too new age on you, he definitely brought some of that, uh, brings some of that to all of us. What we're going to do afterwards is we're going to work our way to the cafe and they were going to be wine and, and, and some brews and stuff like that. Um, any more questions before we, we, we move, move around? And don't be shy and get close to the piece because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's welcoming. Okay. Yes.